If you've been watching the channel for any period of time, you've probably seen the project that we did in Arizona, Nate's storage project. The defining characteristic of that job was the block wall. It was over a thousand feet long and it was eight feet tall and there were truckloads, truckloads of CMU concrete masonry units that were put in that wall at high temperatures. It was over 100 degrees all the time and those guys got a lot of work done and you've probably watched that. This foundation wall, the stem wall on these footings, is interesting because it's exactly the same material engineered in a significantly different way for a significantly different structural purpose. A stem wall, part of a foundation system on a house like this, may look similar to a retaining wall holding up a slope or a decorative block wall around a, um, a garden or around a patio. And yes, the materials are the same, and yes, the labor is almost exactly the same, but the components are put together in a way that makes it significantly different. The layout's been done. I took care of that. I snapped the lines and I know they're right. And so that frees these guys up so that as soon as they set foot on the job, they can fire up the mixer, start mixing the mud, scatter the block exactly where they want it and get to work. When they get to work, the first thing they have to do is lay up the leads in the corners. That is, carefully place the block to exactly the right elevation and exactly the right location at each point where the wall changes direction. Then they can work in between those leads that they have built and just infill the common blocks and the vents and everything else that are associated with it. But they know that the corners and thus the dimensions of the building are already set and they don't have to think about it anymore. The base course, which is laid on the footing to the line, is in many ways the toughest course in the wall. Number one, it's low. You're working down at ankle height. Number two, there may be some deviation in the thickness in the height of the footing that you have to compensate for in your bed joint. Three, the mortar has to be mixed up just right. It has to be stiffer than the, maybe the mortar you're going to be using later in the day because it has to kind of stand up and not be squished or to sag as the weight of the wall increases, particularly in cooler weather. So with the mortar just right and the, and the lines defined and the block scattered out, um, staged appropriately, these guys are going to work establishing the base course off of the leads that Steve's got in place. And this defines whether or not this foundation is going to be accurate. As with every other craft, most of what's happening with masonry is handling material. That means it is super important that the block be located staged correctly. Now, Lenny and I moved the block down into the crawl space, or most of it, and gave our best guess as to where the bond beams and where the, where the smooth face and where the split face block should be staged. We got it, I don't know, maybe half right. The goal of the staging, the reason that staging is so important, is because the only people on the job who are actually producing work are the guys putting the block in the wall. The two assistants, Jason and Danny, are hod carriers. 
And their role on this job is to anticipate what the masons, the block layers, need. And when I say anticipate, I mean anticipate what they're going to need 30 seconds from now, or five minutes from now, or half an hour from now, and make sure that when the block layer turns around and reaches for what he needs, it is where he needs it. That includes cutting the block, stacking the block, mixing the mud, getting the mud there, keeping the mud tempered or moist. It includes, if you need to bring his water bottle over there because you think he's going to be getting thirsty, the more your hod carrier has his head into the game, the more block is going to be in place at the end of the day. Jason, Mike and Steve's brother-in-law, is primarily mixing the mud and making the cuts. He spends most of his time over on that end of the job with, with um, dimensions being yelled at him, confirming that, keeping the mixer going, making sure the mud's the right consistency, getting it into the wheelbarrow, and sort of watching from a distance what they may be needing next. Jason is primarily a framer, which comes in handy when you're measuring block and making cuts. Danny, Steve's son, is primarily taking the mud to where they're working. He is stacking the block, taking the block from the big stacks and getting it close to hand. And then he's striking the joints and brooming off the joints, pointing up the voids that need to be pointed up, just sort of general support right where they're working, keeping, keeping them happy if you can. Now, this crew, once again, is the exception because there are plenty of crews, plenty of crews where one of the hardest people on the planet to keep happy is a mason, but these guys are gentle souls and everybody is pretty well pleased with each other. In exactly the same way that we were very particular in placing the verts coming up out of the footings, we're very particular in placing the horizontal rebar in what is known as bond beams. A bond beam is a horizontal row of block with the webs partially removed so that a piece of rebar can run continuously, horizontally, through one or more of the courses of block. The mortar that Jason is mixing is generally referred to as mud. And like everything else, it's more complicated than you think. We talk about this in pretty good detail in one or two of the videos on Nate's project in Arizona, but block laying mortar is sand and cement and lime. Now it's coming in predetermined ratios. Spec mix is the brand we're using and you just dump the bag in and away you go. In earlier times, you would get mason's sand delivered, you would have bags of cement and bags of lime, and you would shovel it into your mixer in the right proportion. And if I try to spit out that proportion, I'm gonna get it wrong, but it's primarily sand, secondarily cement, and in the third place is a little bit of lime. The lime primarily makes the mortar sticky because it has to be sticky if it's gonna be sticking to the blocks and not getting knocked off. And when I say sticky, I think you can think of this whole mortar mud stuff and um, function as if it was glue or paste. It needs to be sticky enough to stay in place. It needs to hold the blocks together until the mud, the glue, gets hard and it's held in place. It needs to be squishable so that you can tap those blocks down to the right location, but it needs to be strong enough that it will hold the block up in the right location. And then finally, it needs to be smooth enough that it can be smoothed off on the outside or the inside with the thumb or striker and then broom so that it looks reasonably finished. So it has to be capable of doing several things in a hurry all the time without having to think about it. And that is just not all that easy to pull off. Mm -hmm. 
the ability to buy mortar in pre-mixed, pre-measured, carefully calibrated bags is really kind of a revolutionary and, and important time saver. Not only is it a time saver, but it reduces the level of training that your hod carrier has to have. One of the things you don't have to worry about is whether your hod is getting the mix right. You know the mix is right. And so now all you have to be sure of is that he has the right amount of water in the mix. Can you see how that simplifies and reduces opportunities for real shipwreck? I mean, if your hod had been, through ignorance or malice, shorting the cement, there would come a time when you would have a whole bunch of block in the wall and the, and the mortar, when it got hard, just wouldn't be strong enough to hold it in place. Now, there are horror stories, and they are not unfounded, of masons in the past who would intentionally short the cement or short the lime, although they were more likely to short the cement in order to save money. Yeah, well, there are old buildings where you can just lift the bricks right out of the wall because they're just, there's no strength at all to the mortar. But this stuff, this pre-mixed spec mix, is going to get hard, and it's going to be sticky, and it's going to be what you need. This is my first time working with Steve and his brother Mike. Now I'd worked with their brother Joe before, but not these guys. And I wouldn't have had the opportunity except my other masons having shoulder surgery. And I asked him, what am I gonna do? And he said, well, call Steve Siegel. And I called Dustin, Dustin, Gary Roberson can't make it. What am I gonna do? He said, call Steve Siegel. Well, there's two good recommendations right there. So I called him and I'm glad I did. Here's an interesting thing. Mike says he's been framing houses for the last 10 and a half months and it was a nice break to be able to come up back over and lay some block. Steve does all kinds of things. They are very versatile, very well-rounded, very well-respected craftsmen in our community and I just really appreciate the fact that they roared in here and in two and a half days made this happen. Ventilation is really important in a wood frame structure. If the air is not moving in your crawl space, there are spores of fungus that will get started on the wood and will rot your substructure right out. It's called dry rot. It doesn't even have to have water, but it has to have ventilation. And so there was a specific number of vents that were drawn on the plans. I've exceeded that. I've thrown in a few extras because this house doesn't have great cross ventilation because of the grades in the front and the garage on one end. So I just threw in some extra vents. Now the vents have to let the air in, but they can't let the bugs or the pests in. So these vents are screened. We do that on site. We glue um, hardware cloth to the inside of the sunburst pattern, half wide blocks and put them in the hole with enough overlap of the screen past the edges of the block that the mortar itself will hold them in very permanently. These vents are only four inches wide. The top course of block is eight inches wide. So we're using metal flashing on top of the vents to provide a floor or um, a way to stop the grout from just falling through that top course. Now it's not pretty from the inside, but it doesn't have to be pretty. All it has to do is enable that bond beam in the top to be completely full of the grout that is going to make this wall strong.
The higher these walls get, the more things there are to think about. We have to think about the vents. And then we have to start thinking about doorways. There are two doorways that have to be a specific size in a specific place, and the block has to stop in exactly the right place on each side of that door. There's the crawl space. It's the right size. It's in the right place. There's a lintel that spans across the main bearing part of the, of the foundation, and all those things have to be taken care of towards the end of the process. There's also the ongoing um, calculations about which rows have to be split face and where the split face stops and where the split face starts. And so all of these things sort of need to bring everybody's focus to a very sharp point during the last, let's say, 25% of the wall height. The top course, the last course on the wall, also has another bond beam. And this particular bond beam at the top, you can think of kind of like a belt. It's holding in or a it's kind of a, like a chain binder over a load of logs. It's the thing that's holding the world together. And so after everything's done in the right place to the right dimension, with the right appearance, everything is good. You've got to have the steel in the top to make sure that that wall functions as a load-bearing beam that's sitting on grade and distributing the weight of the house uniformly over all of the footings. The best way to cut this block is with a hot saw. The hot saw is essentially a chainsaw motor that will turn a 12 or a 14 inch diameter blade. In this case, we have a diamond blade, a diamond abrasive blade on this hot saw. It works great. Now you can use a skill saw with a diamond blade. You can use a, an angle grinder with a little diamond blade. They'll, they'll work. And they all have one thing in common. They make a lot of dust, especially this hot saw. Now, I recommend that you protect yourself from the silicas that are in that dust. But I'm not these guys' mother. And so this is their choice. I respect that. I try to put a respirator on every chance I get when there's this sort of cementitious dust in the air. Probably smart to do that. Striking these joints, using that metal thumb to press the mortar into the joints and smooth them out, level them out, is partially aesthetic and partially structural. Aesthetically, it smooths things out and it, it, it makes the gap appear to be even and it, you brush it off and it looks, it looks nicer. Structurally, it's pushing the mortar into full contact with the entire bed joint or head joint. It's getting contact between the mud, which is getting a hold of the block on all sides evenly. It's getting the glue in contact with the material that has to be held in place. And so this is not just to make it look nicer, it's also to make it stronger. It's interesting to me that Steve and Mike's dad, Herbert Siegel, was a realtor here in Douglas County for a long, long, long time, well known. And he had a lot of, a lot of boys. And at some point, he developed the property to put in attractive houses. And then his boys were big enough to do the work. So first thing you know, his boys are learning to lay block and learning to frame houses on his own tract. And, end up creating a family construction company when I don't think that may have been his intention, but his boys fell in love with and were drawn to and are making careers out of 
construction. Law of unintended consequences. So pay attention because what you have your family, your kids do or not do is going to have or could have an outcome in their life that you just can't even anticipate for good or for ill. In this case, these guys love what they do. They're well regarded in the community. They're providing a valuable service and I'm just darn glad to be part of the Siegel family construction effort here on this little project of ours. There are two different types of block here. There's smooth face and split face. This introduces something that is important to keep track of while the work is going on, and that is what part of this foundation is going to be covered by dirt, is going to be below grade, and what part of this foundation is going to be visible from the outside, will be part of the curb appeal, will be part of the beauty of the house as you live here and as you work here and as you walk around this building. The block that is above the dirt is split face because it looks nicer. It has an organic, a less manufactured, a more uh, stone-like look. And the brick that is, the block that's down below grade, below the dirt, is smooth face because it doesn't make any difference. It's easier to lay and it costs a little, little less money. So while these guys are laying the block, I am visualizing where the finished grades will be, where the slopes will be, where the sidewalks will be, and which block really needs to be split face because once this stuff is in here and grouted, there's no swapping it out. And it is a permanent mistake to have a smooth block sticking out into, into the visibility when everything else that you can see is a split face block. I've been on a few jobs and it's only a few that were dry. That is, there was no water on site. And so masons had to bring in their water for mixing and for cleaning up. And that's miserable. So if you're going to have some masonry done, make sure you get your water going, will you? Or at least make sure that you have provided the water they're going to need, and they're going to need a lot. It should be potable. I mean, it should be clean water. You can't just count on, you know, pulling water out of some duck pond that happens to be across the street because the, the organic material that's inside that pond water is not going to be good for the strength of your, of your mortar. Shouldn't do it. Don't try it unless it's just an emergency. And of course, there has to be enough for them to clean up or they're going to get so bogged down at the end of the day that the equipment won't work in the morning. Water's important. Staging the material's important. Making sure you've done your part about layout and mobilization and block count. If you want a good product from the men who are there to do your work, you've got to have done your work in getting ready for those guys. In ordering the block on this job, I, I did a count, I figured out what I think I needed, and then when I placed the order, I shorted it one pallet. Because I knew that way I would have enough to keep these guys busy, and as we got close to the end, we kept talking. We, how we short, are we, when, when do we need that block? And at the right moment, I went back and got another pallet of block. I did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, the site was plugged up. It was full, it was jammed. There wasn't room to work as it was, and so it was smart to leave one of the pallets at the yard. And number two, there's a restocking fee to take block back. And it's hard to pick it back up off the ground and put it on a pallet and haul it. And so you don't want to over deliver with the block. You want to just be just a little under the final number and then bring a little cleanup out to get right down to what you need to save time and make it more convenient. And of course, to save some money. Now, if your project is more remote, you need to spend more time than I did actually counting the blocks. So you get the right number plus, I don't know, maybe 20. Why don't you get 20 extra blocks just so the ones that break or get dropped or, you know, you got to have a little bit of pad. But if you don't have the flexibility of being able to get the rest of the material there in 45 minutes, then go ahead and have plenty because you don't want those guys showing up ready to work and then not have work for them to do because you neglected to get the right amount of block on the job.
This foundation wall is an excellent example of allowable tolerances. The only part of this wall, of this foundation, that is ever going to be seen by anyone except a plumber is going to be the split face portions on the outside. Everything else is either covered by dirt on the outside or covered by a house on the inside. And so if there's a head joint or something, a bed joint that's not perfectly pointed up or there's a void or a spot or a, an overhang or something didn't get quite struck, it doesn't matter except in those areas it will be appearance grade from the outside. And there it does matter. So I'm very pleased with how these guys did it. They got it done in a hurry. The price was fair. The product is straight, it's square, plumb, and true, and the parts that have to look good, look good. This illustrates a point that you can make a job as perfect as you can afford. But if you can't afford it, then you probably have sort of assigned the wrong value in the wrong place. If you are curious about the costs associated with this block work, we're making all of that available to our supporters. You'll find the information on how to access that in the notes to this video. The next and final step in this foundation is to grout these walls, solid grout them. Fill the whole thing up with grout mix. It's satisfying, it's fun, because you know you're turning this into a foundation instead of just the shell of a foundation. So if you're interested in that, check out our next video. And as always, thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.